Hi, this is Josh Placer from GameWisdom.com. Welcome to another Critical Thought. For this video, I'm talking about making games and game design accessible to multiple skill groups at the same time. There's two parts of this kind of discussion. There's the tutorial side of things, where you're basically teaching the player in a proper manner, similar to my gating piece. And then there's actually from a design or mechanics point of view making sure that your lower level players are being presented challenges that allow them to grow without overwhelming them while your higher level players are still having something to do something to shoot for so they're not just bored and waiting for the game to you know take the gloves off as you can see we got a few more amiibos here specifically in the from Nintendo's main characters or main flagships because they are a really good example of this. Nintendo's game design has really evolved over the years and it's pretty much their main claim to fame next to their characters. I had a podcast discussion which by the time you're watching this won't be up for at least a few weeks but I wanted to talk about this while this topic was still fresh in my mind. While early Nintendo games, such as the pre-64 era, mainly dealt with presenting mechanics and systems in a linear fashion, Nintendo did a really good job later on with properly giving, I guess, both sides of the coin different challenges or different means of getting through a level. And actually, the first example of that would be with our friend Fox McCloud here with Star Fox. And I believe it would be Star Fox 64, but I'm pretty sure the first Star Fox also had this. And what they did is that each, there's multiple paths in a Star Fox game, usually easy, medium, or hard. And this wasn't just a simple case of difficulty, you know, running through the same level, but maybe there's more ships or enemies have more health, but radically different paths with different levels and different challenges. For instance, I remember one of the horror paths in the original Star Fox was a very challenging run through a space station, which tasked the player to quickly maneuver around walls, you know, like sliding in and up and every which way to stop the player. Now this was an advanced challenge and something that a new player probably would have been able to handle. But if you were good enough and if let's say you already mastered the game from the beginning this was something you could get to by simply choosing the harder path. And that's a very important part of this kind of balancing difficulty. The options have to be presented to both players but it's not forced. That's the big point. When you play a game like Super Mario Galaxy, you can do triple jumps and wall jumps and all that crazy stuff from the minute, from the first minute, but the game is not challenging or actively forcing you to do that because they know that the new players aren't ready for that skill yet. But the beauty of Nintendo's design is that it pre presents this carrot for new for players to go for. For the new players, it's basically saying, oh, you know, you like this level? Well, there's something way up here, but you need to improve. And if you improve, there's a reward waiting for you. And keep that reward in the back of your mind. I'll be coming back to that in a minute. For the expert players, Nintendo says, okay, you know how to run and jump. That's all amazing and great. But if you think you're that good, can you handle this? Can you wall jump into a spin jump, then do a triple jump to get this gold star or the star coin or whatever? And that gives new, or I'm sorry, that gives expert players something else to go for. So they're not just going through the motions. Too many games simply force players of all skill levels into the same track. This means that the expert players have to wait for the game to open up. It's where that con that expression, you know, the real game begins at, you know, hour 5 or hour 15 or whatever comes into play. And that's not, that's also not good design. While you don't want to rush new players into strange mechanics or situations, you also don't want to force your experts or your core base to basically just sit around, sit around their hands waiting for you to say, okay, now we'll give you a challenge. Another good example of that 
would be from our little friend Kirby here. While the Kirby series has never been a quote-unquote flagship title, it's going to move Fox back into our little frame here, there has been a, several good examples of Kirby games featuring this kind of, I guess, split design or accommodating multiple skill groups. In one of the later Kirby games, I think it was Superstar Saga, there was challenges, I think it was the Great Cave Offensive, which asked you to collect as many treasures as you could. And again, a normal player who wasn't skilled could just get through it, beat the game, call a day. But the option was there to grow and improve your skills and get all the treasures and thereby get, you know, the best ending. And Kirby challenges, especially when you're going for the expert stuff, such as Kirby and Canvas Curse, were really freaking hard. I'm not talking hard as in, you know, a normal game for kids. I'm talking hard for all skill levels. Try getting 100% on Canvas Curse and you'll see what I mean. But the real proof of the proof is in the pudding in terms of Nintendo letting the gloves come off is with, of course, our favorites, and that is the flagship Mario games. Super Mario Galaxy, and particularly Super Mario 3D World, featured some very, very difficult bonus or secret levels. And what we talked about on the podcast is that the beauty of this is that the player is basically learning organically through playing the game. So the new players are going to learn things in the order that Nintendo presents them. And they're presenting them in a way that they're basically teaching you through parts. So you're not going to learn how to do a triple wall jump into a spin jump immediately. First the game's going to teach you how to do a normal, number, ah, normal jump, then a double jump, then a triple jump, then it will go for a wall jump, then it will go for a spin jump. And then there won't be an actual training of a triple wall jump into a spin jump. Instead the game basically is assuming that the player has learned these individual elements and can then process the schema to combine it all. So instead of creating like troll levels or levels that require pixel point precision that you have to play until you memorize it, the game just presents these challenges organically to the player and assumes that the player will be able to basically piece everything together and make it work. And Honestly, Super Mario 3D World has one of the hardest final levels. I have yet to actually play through that and beat it. I got close once, but it took like hours of practicing just to get it to go. And again, that was a level that combined all these individual elements of expert play and then just combines them all into something original. Now, while we're talking about balancing multiple skill levels through design, A major example of that, and one of my favorite games of all time, would be The World Ends With You. This is my favorite game from Square Enix. Just an insanely unique and complex game, which I could probably have its own critical thought on, and maybe I will real soon. But the point I want to talk about is that the game gives the player complete control in determining the difficulty. You can choose how many battles to fight in a row, You can choose how much max health you have. You can choose a difficulty setting. And all these things are factored into the rewards. And one last example before we talk more about the rewarding side. Kid Icarus Uprising on the 3DS is a criminally underrated game from Nintendo. The game, again, gives the player complete freedom to decide how hard they want to make it. And then rewards the player accordingly. Now, the reward side is critical for these kinds of approaches. There has to be something to motivate the player. You can't just have advanced challenges and simply have achievements. There has to be an in-game reason to do this. One, because it gives the expert players something to shoot for. And two, it motivates new players to learn the game. Most novice or newer players aren't going to care about achievements, but they will care about new content. And that's the beauty of what Nintendo has done with a lot of their games. Even going as far back as Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, there are advanced challenges if you can 100% each level in a world. 
and that's what makes this such a great way to motivate the player and so again sort of organically pushed them into learning these systems by saying oh you're good at the game but we have all this really great content but you're not ready for it yet but come back once you've gotten better another great example of that would be like Donkey Kong Country 2 which has the quote unquote good ending or the fantastic ending unlocked if you can beat all the special challenges of the game and get 100% and Cranky Kong basically just like taunts a player saying oh you're never going to be good enough to do that and if you're good enough you'll get some really amazing level designs and that's one of the beauties of these kinds of approaches when you're that good and the developers are free to take the gloves off you can really see the apex of these designs and like we see this in like the Star World of Super Mario World, again the secret levels of Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, and etc. Now to just quickly go back to my point on gating, the challenge of that is you want to properly show these mechanics off while still presenting advanced stuff. Recently I played the game Bit Shifter that also did a reasonable job on this. Playing through the game normally, the game just asks you to beat the level. But there's advanced challenges set up from the minute, from the very first mid, such as get through without dying, find all the hidden collectibles, beat the game under or beat the level under a part time. Now these advanced challenges have no progression mechanics other than the golden bugs. But they're simply a way to challenge expert players, give them something else to do in a level while giving novice players something else to shoot for and a reason to grow. And that's why you need these rewards. There has to be a reason. One of the problems with a lot of games and some of N Nintendo's less than high quality titles that go this approach is when there is no reason to grow. You can give me, you know, a 100%, but unless there's an actual reason to do this and something to shoot for, then most players aren't going to do this. Now the hardcore completists, they're going to go for it, like myself. But it's much more motivating to have that in-game reward. And if you can think of any more examples or any comments you want to say about this, be sure to leave them in the notes below or leave them in the comment below. But we're going to wrap up this critical thought here. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening to me rant for the last about 13 minutes. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, it always helps out. Check out game-wisdom.com where I examine the art and science of games. Be sure to follow me on Twitter under GWBicer for the latest updates of new content. And of course you can find me on Patreon under Game Wisdom. Donations will be greatly appreciated. They allow me to keep supporting myself while putting out great content. You can get some really great treats, including unlocking more podcasts for everyone to enjoy. And you can find all the information for that over there. So once again, I'm going to switch back over to my other play or my other video here so we can end the video. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you all real soon with another Critical Thought.